Hi, I'm Joe with E38 Survey Solutions, and in this video, we'll talk about collecting ground control points with the REACH RS2. First, a little bit about us. Event 38 Unmanned Systems was founded in 2011. Uh, we're the oldest and largest dealer of the MLID equipment, and we started using their receivers and our drones. And once they really expanded to the RS Pluses, um, and the popularity uh, was there with the RS2 as well, we started this new store. Uh, E38 survey solutions to support that uh, more thoroughly. So more survey equipment in terms of survey accessories, data collectors, softwares, um, and now more receivers as well. And we have much more to come. So to get started, I wanted to go briefly over GNSS, uh, or sometimes just GPS receivers is what we'll call them, but the entire makeup of all the constellations is a GNSS receiver. Um, so the big ones are GPS, GLONASS, Galileo, and BIDO. Those are the ones that cover the whole globe, uh, whereas these other ones are just regional. So these global uh, coverage satellite systems, they have enough satellites, again, to so that we can see enough satellites anywhere on the Earth at any point in time. Whereas these regional coverage systems, they only have uh, a limited number of satellites that orbit uh, just around a specific area. So these satellites are sending down um, sending out information in terms of where they're located and at what time they sent that message so that the receiver can calculate the distance uh, between the receiver and each of these satellites. Uh, from there, we can do some math to get an exact location of our GPS receiver. Uh, and this would be great if not for a number of different error sources, um, the earth rotating, uh, clock errors, multipath, uh, different atmosphere errors, and, and more. So what we do is we set up a base to send us corrections. So oftentimes that means we have a base on site and it's talk, talking, uh, talking to the rover, sending those corrections over in live in real time. Uh, but we can also do post-processing and send those later. The other common way of getting corrections to your rover is through, through the internet using NTRIP. And usually this means um, something like what we have in Ohio is uh, the ODOT network, uh, where they have 50 plus base stations and they send that information to the internet and they basically log into their server and pull down their data. So that's typically what we're talking about when we're talking about NTRIP. It's about uh, using someone else's base stations um, over the internet. I want to get in, into accuracy a little bit here. Uh, so if we have a single or autonomous solution, that's a, that means we're not getting any corrections. We have you know, five plus feet easily in terms of accuracy. Uh, if we are getting corrections, but the solution is not great, we might have an RTK float solution where we might get down to subfoot, uh, but again, it, it could be worse. And then the RTK fix is when we're expecting that sub inch accuracy. That RTK fix accuracy will be in terms of relative accuracy. Um, so any measurement between two points uh, will be just as good as globally accurate points. Uh, but to actually put it in the right spot on the globe and not be translated um, or shifted, uh, then we need our base coordinate to be known. We need, we need an accurate base coordinate, um, again, or else we'll be shifted. So we'll talk about a few different methods of getting that accurate base coordinate and ultimately globally accurate ground control points. Uh, one we kind of mentioned before was the RTK network service provider. Uh, we'll use their base stations to calculate our base station accurately. Or we'll use NGS survey marks, find a mark, set our base up over that and use their accurate coordinate that's already been surveyed. Or we could use Opus to calculate a accurate a globally accurate point and then enter that point into our base station. And then lastly, we'll mention using Opus, uh, but also processing our rover data later, uh, which can, can be more convenient for a number of reasons. When you're searching for one of these service providers, uh, you just want to make sure you have adequate coverage in your area and that you have RTCM3 messages being sent out. Uh, a lot of states have free, uh, free networks. So if you search your state's DOT, you might find that you have a free network and you can, you can use theirs. Um, so it'll be pretty simple. You just need to make sure your RS2 is connected to the internet. Uh, then in correction input, you'll just enter those, uh, the network service provider and trip credentials. 
um, and from there you'll be pulling down their corrections. Another way of getting those globally accurate ground control points is to set your base up over a known point. Uh, they have survey marks throughout the U.S. Uh, that are published online and an interactive map on the NGS website where you can find these marks. So if you have a mark close to your site, you can set your base up over that mark and enter that survey mark coordinate in the base mode section of your RS2. And that'll give you those accurate, globally accurate coordinates on your rover. Another way of setting up over a known point or, or getting a known point is to use Opus to create a globally accurate point for our base. Uh, so we'll set our RS2 to log data for 90 plus minutes as a rule of thumb. Uh, we'll upload that log to Opus and maybe 45 minutes or so later, they will send us back an accurate coordinate in an email and we can use that for our base coordinate to get us in that globally accurate uh, solution. Now, in conjunction with Opus, we can do PPK processing, and this might help if we need kind of a one quick shot on site. If we don't have much time um, to spend on site, we can do all our, all our surveying in one shot and then process in Opus and then process in PPK later. Uh, so basically, we will store data on our base, again, probably 90 plus minutes, um, and we'll also log data on our rover and we'll collect GCPs like normal. And that'll be relatively accurate at that point. Uh, but then when we go back to the office, we can process that base log with Opus and then get that coordinate. And then we can process our GCPs against that new coordinate with our old log. And we'll end up with globally accurate uh, ground control points. And just a quick note on relative accuracy. Um, there's plenty of cases, lots of cases where that's all you need. So for instance, if you're doing stockpile uh, you know, volume calculations. You don't need to know where those piles are at in the world. Uh, you just need to know, you know accurate tonnage. Um, or if you're on uh, someone's job site where they have their own assumed coordinate system, so they could set up their base over 5,000, 5,000, um, and then just kind of run from there. And it's not a real coordinate system, so you might have to localize to it. Um, so what you can do is get a program like Field Genius. Um, or th there's plenty of other data collectors that'll do it, but we sell Field Genius and that'll allow you to localize to any kind of arbitrary assumed or local coordinate system. Now I want to talk a little bit about uh, why the RS2 is such a good product for collecting ground control points or collecting accurate data in general. I want to talk about a study we did with the RS2 versus TACON's latest receiver, the Hyper-VR. Um, we knew where the trouble spots were on this land, and we knew um, where these older receivers weren't ever able to get a fix. Um, so it was a cool study to do. We basically went side by side with, with the latest and greatest, and um, you know where those old spots, where those old receivers couldn't even get a fix, um, both the VR and the RS2 were able to get a fix. So pretty cool to see that. And in terms of results, uh, they're basically identical. The RS2 did a little better across the board, but um, just the nature of the test and the nature of GPS in general, uh, you know, tomorrow that could be different and the next day that could be different. Um, so the, the good thing here, the takeaway is, you know, we compared really well to the VR and we compared really well in a lot of tough environments. The big reason for why we're able to ha have that type of accuracy and that type of comparison against the top of the line receiver is because we're tracking everything, tracking all four of those global constellations. Um, and I want to highlight a few other specs too. We have uh, internal radio on the RS2. So if we're using base and rover, we have uh, up to a five mile range. Uh, let's get a long battery life, 16 hours as a network rover, 22 hours uh, collecting static. And it is IP67 waterproof. So and to finish things off, I wanted to talk about, you know, real world success our customers are having. So we've got you know, a couple land surveying companies who really expanded their fleet. So. Mixstein's got, I don't know, 10, 12 crews, uh, some using network rovers, some using them as base rovers. Uh, they've, they've expanded that fleet over the last year and a half or so, and, and they're, they're keeping, they're expanding that uh, continually. Campbell and Associates, same thing. Uh, they're a little newer to the RS2, so over the last six months or so, they've uh, kind of expanded to about nine receivers. Uh, CSX, they've got static, they're using their receivers for static, they've got seven. Uh, they, Department of Natural Resources, they're using these under tree canopy 
Uh, this is their forestry division, and they have 30 RS2s. And Austin Powder is probably our largest uh, or our oldest uh, our oldest customer. And they've got 30 plus combined RS2s and RS2 receivers. And um, overall, we sold 1,000 plus of these in the last couple of years. Um, and, and we'll leave it there. Thanks for watching.